Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Chairman, and thanks for the kind introduction. I will definitely tell you what is the best backbone for each thing to do. Um, uh, I think it's one of the most difficult talks of my career because you will not have many friends after this, but I think we will make the best out of it, and I think it is a really fascinating thing to walk through the data. Let's start. What do we know from cytotoxics before we think about combining them with targeted agents? We know that they work, and from the backbone of those trials, uh, we also know that combination chemotherapy is preferred uh, when compared to monotherapy, and I think uh, you're all familiar with the results of these trials. So when we now think about the combination of cytotoxics with biologics, we have to consider that there are interactions. We have chemotherapy, which improves patient prognosis, and hopefully by the biologics add to the improvement. So this will we call additive. On the other hand, we can also have chemotherapy being combined with a biologic, and maybe this extends the improvement in progression-free survival and overall survival to a maximum, and maybe also impacts on the function of chemotherapy, and this we would call highly synergistic. On the other hand, we can have also chemotherapy and a biologic which does not add too much. In fact, it's partly inhibiting, it's limiting the benefit of chemotherapy, and this we would just call non-additive because results of the combination are as equal as the, as the chemotherapy alone. And you can also imagine that other things can happen. You can get chemotherapy combined with biologicals which act against chemotherapy, this can limit the benefit of chemotherapy and even lead to a detrimental effect. And then we have to ask, what is responsible for this? Is it the biology of the interaction of the two drugs? Is it toxicity? Or are there any other explanations? If we now consider what is the best backbone for each combination, we have to ask what is the best endpoint and what are the best parameters to assess this. Is it the best interaction, biologically proven, leading to the maximal benefit? Or is it the largest gain from the biologic? For example, does it make sense to combine a biologic with a relatively weak chemotherapy to exploit the maximum out of the function of the biologic. It makes no sense for the patient's perspective, but it could be the best combination partner for the biologic. Or should we regard the combination with the best tolerability as the best option for those patients? And also, if we think about the best combinations, we should address the question to which criteria we should apply this. Is it the synergistic interaction in the preclinic, and we don't have many data on of this, is it the available data from any clinical observation, or should we limit our knowledge uh, to the basis what we learn from randomized phase free trials? And even if we integrate all the clinical data, we have to ask what would be the best endpoint to assess the best combination? Is it, for example, response rate to see a better response acts uh, interactively? Or is it PFS, where you have a prolongation of PFS, or is it maybe also overall survival? So we have to ask this for the different drugs, and I will start my talk with bevacizumab. If you look on the pivotal trials where bevacizumab was combined to uh, cytotoxics in comparison to chemotherapy alone, we have data from many randomized trials. You're familiar, this is, works nicely with the IFL regimen versus placebo, improvement in response rate, progression-free survival, and overall survival. And it works also nicely with Folfox or Zelox in first line or Folfox in second line treatment. But if you look on the extent of the benefit, and I just limit to the hazards ratio, it likely appears that the gain by adding this to IFL is higher than adding this to first or second line <coughs> um, Fox or Zelox in this setting. What else do we learn? We have further trials where bevacizumab is com combined with single-agent treatment, 5 of you alone versus placebo, or the AVEX trial recently presented capecitabine plus bevacizumab versus capecitabine alone, also extended progression-free survival and also in trend overall survival. What we have also learned is that there is very likely, if we take the whole range of data, not large of a difference between oxaliplatin and irinotecan. But here the first limitations occur because we don't have very strong data for the combination Folfiri bevacizumab versus Folfiri alone. If you look on the whole range of data as shown here, we can see that we can expect a PFS 
if we take all phase three trials and all the experimental or standard arms in these phase three trials for the combinations of oxaliplatin-based chemotherapy with bevacizumab and irantecan-based chemotherapy with uh, bevacizumab, and we will end up in a PFS of 10 to 12 months and also with the same um, overall survival, but clearly no randomized data for the benefit of Folfiri plus bevacizumab. Are there any comparing data for Folfox or Folfiri backbone plus bevacizumab compared to each other? Not for Folfox or Folfiri, but just recently we published a paper for Kpox beva versus Kbiri beva. 247 patients have been randomized, and you can see that PFS is, and overall survival is about the same, whether this is chemotherapy backbone with Cape Erie or Cape Ox. So again, no large difference in this. There are, with bevacizumab, some special relations. I call it special relation because this is not a standard question on the interaction in a first-line upfront treatment. For example, what about four drug combinations? What about maintenance treatment? And what about treatment beyond progression? Regarding the four, trial, uh, the, the four drug combination, the phase three trial uh, tribe presented from Alfredo Falcone at ASCO has shown that Folfoxiri plus bevacizumab yields a uh, surprisingly PFS of 12.2 months and also a very nice overall survival, the longest overall survival ever reported in a phase three trial. But of note, this was not compared to the triple chemotherapy without bevacizumab, but to a doublet with bevacizumab. So not clear answer whether this is a good combination. But we have learned that those four drug regimens with bevacizumab or free chemotherapy drug regimen plus bevacizumab are tolerated quite well if you look on the range of reported toxicity. I think that this works. This leads to a long PFS with a tolerable toxicity. The second question is, what about maintenance treatment? We have at least three trials being reported, one upcoming, which um, use fluoropyrimidine and bevacizumab as maintenance, but none of them compares uh, bevacizumab maintenance uh, with 5-FU to 5-FU alone. We have learned, for example, from the Cairo trial that in this trial, the experimental maintenance arm, or is it a standard maintenance arm, with capecitabine and bevacizumab, improves time to second progression and also um, progression-free survival two, and of course progression-free survival one. But is this a strong evidence that this is the ideal combination partner? We cannot say it in comparison to five of you, but we can say it by the absolute meaning of the result that this very likely is. And also, if you look on the third specific situation, the TML-like situation, we cannot see a difference in terms of chemotherapy showing the interaction of um, addition of TML, meaning bevacizumab beyond progression, with oxaliplatin-based chemotherapy and irinotecan-based chemotherapy. We cannot see a difference here. So if I'd like to summarize bevacizumab with cytotoxic, we have highly consistent data with all chemotherapy regimens. The limitations are for theory, and I would say this is a clear sign for additive uh, efficacy. We have surprisingly good phase free data from single to triple chemotherapy, and the benefit is maybe a bit less pronounced when we have a better chemotherapy, but this is a matter of discussion. We have the special situations, maintenance with fluoropyrimidines and TML strategy, where we can say the efficacy is independent from chemotherapy, and you will all agree that toxicity is not a major concern. Second drug, aflibercept. Aflibercept, it's much clearer because we only have two trials, a randomized phase three trial, second line, Velour trial, Fall Fury, Aflibercept versus Placebo, <coughs> and the first line trial, Fall Fox, Aflibercept versus Fall Fox. And what we have seen is that we have a, a very strong signal in the second line trial with Fall Fury, whereas we have not a strong signal from the first line phase two trial for the combination of Fall Fox. What does it mean? We have an overall survival gain with Folfiri's second line, and here it is clearly at least additive, but we have no benefit with Folfox in first line, and hey, maybe here we can say it's not additive, but we have to consider there are limitations due to this, this is only phase two data. And the questions arising from this is, what will be the results if we would have used Folfiri first line, or whether we would have used Folfox second line? So I can't give you a clear answer to this. Coming to the third chapter, which is the EGF receptor inhibitors, and this is the most complicated chapter, as you know. I think data are very clear when we look to EGF receptor antibodies 
compared to cytotoxics alone when we consider the Folfiri or irinotecan backbone. You can see here these three trials. Second line trial, Folfiri, Panitumumab, the EPIC trial with irinotecan, Cetuximab, and also, of course, the first line crystal trial, Folfiri plus Cetuximab. And we can see that we have a clear improvement in terms of progression-free survival, so this is at least additive. What we have also seen is that we have, for this combination, Cetuximab with irinotecan, a special relation. I call it special relation because it refers to something which we haven't entirely understood. And these data are very old, but they're still not entirely understood. This is the relation of cetuximab plus irinotecan and the story we have learned from the bond trial. Because in the bond trial, patients were refractory to irinotecan and adding cetuximab to irinotecan resensitized in a, a way, irinotecan, so showing superior efficacy from the combination of the irinotecan combination with cetuximab than irinotecan alone, and therefore, um, excuse me, cetuximab alone, there's a typo in it, uh, so therefore there is a, um, let's say, specific interaction of this. What is, on the other hand, the interaction with oxaliplatin? We have learned, if you look on the KRAS wild type population, um, that Folfox cetuximab and Folfox panitumumab on the basis of a randomized phase two and a phase three trial also improved hazards ratio, but you can see maybe to a different extent. But that's clear data for additive efficacy. But on the other hand, we also have to handle these two trials, Folfox or KPOX, which set the, the UK COIN trial, and also the Nordic 7 study using FLOX chemotherapy backbone plus minus cetuximab without improvement of progression-free survival and with a potentially detrimental effect also in terms of overall survival. So maybe we have other special relations. Panitumumab with oxaliplatin may act different than cetuximab with oxaliplatin. And we'll also have to have a look on the EGF receptor antibodies with singles and triples. First of all, looking on the interaction of Folfox and panitumumab. What we have learned here in the initial analyses is that in KRAS wild type, we have a clear benefit, whereas in KRAS mutants, we may have or we have a detrimental effect when we treat mutant patients with Folfox and panitumumab. We have now learned the story that we need more testing to make the treatment more precise. We have now learned that the testing should not be limited to exon 2 mutations on KRAS, but also rather also include exon 3 and 4, and not only KRAS testing, but also NRAS testing. Taking this together, we find another group of patients which may have a detrimental effect. Those are other mutants X exon 2. So also the other mutants may have a detrimental effect and therefore we have to consider this. This is not the best place to develop this drug in and this is clearly a good signal that we can biologically find non-interacting uh, drug combinations. On the other hand, we also have data coming from other trials which are not clearly based on the molecular understanding. For example, the Nordic 7 trial also, the detrimental effect for the KRAS mutant has been shown, and no benefit for the KRAS wild type. And maybe, this may be related to the chemotherapy regimen. And we also have to consider the data, although we all have not entirely understood what happened here, from the new EPOCH trial, where we also had a detrimental effect in the subset of patients with clearly resectable metastases, uh, liver metastases, where there was not a synergistic effect by contrast, it was again at least a strong signal for a detrimental effect as seen here. And maybe again, in these combinations, the interaction with the chemotherapy backbone is the most important thing um, to see in the backbone treatment analyses. There is no benefit with the two um, oxaliplatin-containing regimen, whereas there may be a benefit with irinotecan and modified de Gramont. Um, Please note that there is only a limited sample size and limited patient number being treated here. But this is again setting up this interesting hypothesis that the interaction with Folfox is different or with oxaliplatin is different compared to the interaction with um, irinotecan. And this is the, also part of the story we learned from the COIN trial, from the UK COIN trial, that maybe the synergistic activity may be shown when we look on the subgroup of patients being treated in this trial where the chemo backbone could either have been 
5 of you oxaliplatin or cytabine oxaliplatin. And if you look to the 5 of you oxaliplatin, you can see that there may be a synergy, whereas with capecitabine based regimen, that there is no synergy. So the question with oxaliplatin, what is it? Is it oxaliplatin per se? Is it oxaliplatin in the wrong patient cohort, meaning not being pan wild type? Or is it rather the interaction with the oral fluoropyrimidines? And we have some also interesting data, data from the German trial from the group of Volker Heinemann, where, where they had a um, com non comparative trial, Zelirisituximab versus Zeloxituximab. So, Cetuximab being used with capecitabine with either irantecan and oxaliplatin. And the findings of these trials are shown here. KRAS mutants didn't better than KRAS wild types and oxaliplatin combinations did, one might say, as worse as irinotecan based combinations. So maybe in this combination it's not only limited to capecitabine oxaliplatin, the non-benefit may also be seen with capecitabine irinotecan based combinations. Coming to the rare data with EGF receptor antibodies in the four drug combinations, and I think you will agree that we have promising high response rates for folfurinox in different regimens combined with cetuximab, but we also have the limitations of toxicity. And if I like to summarize here the anti-EGFR interaction, we can say that we have very consistent data with irinotecan first line, second line for theory, second, third line, irantecan. This is additive, maybe it's even synergistic and it's never detrimental. We have highly inconsistent data with full Fox. This ranges from additive to detrimental. And we don't have major data with triplets because those results are far too early. And we don't have any interaction data with singles, so meaning with five of you are capecitabine only, and we have to ask why we don't have this. Toxicity is also for the combinations of cytotoxics with EGF receptor antibodies, not a major concern, but it may be a concern with the triplets. To summarize this, what are the pros and cons of all these different combinations? I played the card by showing the chemotherapy, the, the biologicals, and now I turn the card and say, what could we add as best when we have a chemotherapy being defined? If you look on Folfox first line, we can clearly say we have a clear pro for bevacizumab on the basis of a positive phase three trial in terms of PFS. We have a large and consistent database and also the interesting approach in de-escalating treatment and using the maintenance strategy following Folfox beva or Kpox beva has been proven. On the other hand, for EGF receptor antibodies, we also have supportive data coming from the trial, the prime trial with penitumumab being clearly positive, also in overall survival, if you look on the pen rus wild type, and we also have to consider the high response rates in correct liver metastases. On the con side, for the EGF receptor antibodies, we have the heterogeneous effect with the cetuximab trial. We don't have a convincing phase three trial with cetuximab, and we have to consider that maybe also the fluoropyrimidine at the backbone matters. And the con for bevacizumab is clearly the NOC6 trial. We have to ask whether this benefit in this trial, which used a Folfox and Zelox combined analyses, was maybe more pronounced in the Zelox group. But the most, I think, important factors are those who benefit. Coming to the second option, what is about Folfox second line? This is much easier because here we have a clear data from the E3200 trial with the overall survival gain in a phase three trial and also TML with BEVA being patients being treated with Folfiori first line then Folfox second line with BEVA led to overall, improved overall survival. Coming to Zelox, first and second line, the same finding as with Folfox, PFS benefit being seen here, and we, I would say we should strongly dis, uh, discourage the use of Zelox combination with EGF receptor antibodies on the basis of the data we have in our hands to date. What about 5 of you alone, 5 of you capecitabine alone? The ProBeva is three randomized trials, all with a PFS benefit, and the PFS seen for this combination is approximately nine months. So this is a large and a long PFS without combination of cytotoxics, clear pro. What about Folfiori first line? And this is the most difficult topic to discuss today. Because if you look to BEVA, we only have data from phase three control arm, and we have large database on phase four. 
we have, don't have a clear phase three trial, we have the IFL trial, but that's of note, not for the theory. On the other hand, for the EGF receptor antibodies, we have strong data coming from two randomized phase three trial, CRYSTAL and FIRE free, with a clear overall survival gain. And the only, let's say, malice is that we don't have a clear information on the de-escalation. Is the FIRE trial the definitive answer that we should treat this patient with for theory? I will not um, predict now what we will see in the talk uh, being presented by Dr. Modest and being discussed by Dr. Van Nuk, but I think we have to consider that we still haven't seen differences in standard first-line parameters in this trial, and we have the, for me, yet unclear and unexplained difference in terms of overall survival, where we can ask many questions, and maybe we will learn from Dr. Van uh, discussion what the hypotheses should be herein. So, for theory, for the current moment of being, I would say, and I like to go back, it fa there is a slight advantage for the EGF receptor antibodies as combination partners, but still many questions to be answered. And with the last fall theory second line, we have a clear strong data pro VEGF coming from the Velour data with aflibercept. We have a clear pro of using bevacizumab when we have bevacizumab fall fox in first line coming from the TML trial. Also, with fall theory second line, we have strong data for EGF receptor antibodies coming from the panitumumab trial. And in cetuximab, I remind that we have this special relation in irritantecan pretreated and even refractory patients that they can somehow maybe be sensitized by adding irritantecan. We have the cons, no overall survival benefit here, and I think the strongest argument is the, clearly the clear phase-free positive data. And with the last, options for combinations, I think there are many pros and cons. We don't have a clear single trial which ever used folfoxiri plus minus a cytotoxic I cannot say whether this really adds something. We have to say from the TRIBE trial that this is the phase three trial with the longest PFS and overall survival. So therefore, this could be also be considered. And we have also the promising data in terms of response rates with the EGF receptor antibodies, although toxicity may be a concern here. However, at the end of my talk, I'd like to again remind you to the limitations of this. These are just snapshots from the currently available data of the trial portfolio. We don't have a clue why we don't have a full theory first line trial with bevacizumab, why we don't have a full Fox trial with cetuximab in second line. So therefore we can't make statements because we just haven't the data. And we have to consider that we have heterogeneity of the results between trials, treatment lines, etc. We have only very, very few comparative trials. In fact, I've shown you the most of them. And the question is, whether the biological backbone and the information on the synergy of the biologic with the cytotoxic are, adic are adequate, adequately integrated, I would say no. And for the further development, of course, we should make this not only on the basis of observations, but rather on the biological data we have from pharmacogenomics, metabolomics, etc. I think you will all agree that we have an urgent need to work on this. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention.